We are here in Hoopston, Illinois. This is the 8th day of November 2007. We're here with Hal, Hal uh, Burge and the videographer is um, Henry Ra Wait, stop. <laughs> and again, we are rolling and recording and we can do that again. All right. Today we're here in Hoopston, Illinois with Hal Burge. It is November the 8th, 2007. Videographer is, is uh, Henry Radcliffe, and the interviewer is Nancy Rotzel. Hal, where were you when World War II started? World War II, when it started, uh, I was working on the railroad over in Indiana, near Bluffton, Indiana. I was driving along, I was going to meet a girlfriend that afternoon, and then an old couple had a flat tire on the car, and the wind was blowing strong from the west, and I stopped with my car behind them to see if I could help them. I was by myself, and uh, I had an old, back then, a 36 Chevrolet, which wasn't too good, wasn't too bad, and uh, I saw there was two women in the car, and the old men was trying to figure out how to jack it up, so I asked him that they had just get the women in my car, I left the engine running and the heater was on because it was cold and wind blowing. So I changed the tire and while they were in my car that Sunday afternoon, the radio on, they heard about Pearl Harbor. And they was both so sympathetic with me because they knew military, you'd get drafted or have, be in a war. So later on, uh, I wasn't bothered very much with it, but I was thought about it. And uh, I worked at different jobs. I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, working for a while with my uncle that lived over there. I worked in a U.S. printing company along, along with them. And then I got my draft notice, and uh, oh, this was in the spring of 42. Got my draft notice, and I said, well, I'm going back home and work around Hoops until they call me to actually go in. So I did come back, and I worked at the canning company share. And I quit the canning company and I went over to the railroad on, in Rankin on the section. I worked there until I got my, uh, well, I, I got my physical, first physical in July of 42 in Danville. And then I later on was called up to report November, I mean October the, of 1942. 19, October the 20th, 1942 was my first induction into the Army. Everything was Army back then. So we went to Chicago and had our physicals and took all this stuff, and the doctors checked us all out real good, make sure everybody was available for service. And very few got turned down. But anyway, they said, go back home and get all your papers in order and everything and report back on uh, November the 3rd. So we did, and I ended up in Camp Grant, Illinois. That's up by Rockford and spent a few days there, and they assembled a bunch of people to go to basic training. Well, during the time at Camp Grant, uh, we had a battery of tests to take to see what you might be able to do for the government or the Army or the military or whatever. And some men even, I think, got drafted in the, to the Navy or were assigned there. But when I went, they wanted uh, people for tank corps, the medics, or the Air Force. Well, I was a just had an eighth grade education and prior to World War II you had to be a high school graduate to get in the Air Force. So my uh, thinking that I would never make the Air Force and I didn't want the medics so I put in tank corps for my first choice and the Air Force, Army Air Corps would be the second. But I always thought of airplanes. My first ride was in an old tri-motor airplane back in about 1933 and that was a great thing to be up there in the air. So anyway we get to Keeser Field after about four days running around all over the southeastern United States. They didn't want ever anybody to know where that train was going with all these men on it. And I stayed down there for my basic training. <clears throat> and they was always putting out bulletins or wanting people to join uh, this or that. You know, I wanted to be on an airplane, so I tried to join a, as a gunner or something like that. But it wouldn't let me because when I passed these tests in Chicago, uh, Rockford, I'd been uh, made uh, about 98 on my automotive exam because I'd worked on cars before, see, and uh, this and that. In the CC camps, I worked on trucks for six months. So anyway, 
I couldn't go anywhere. So I ended up after my basic training uh, of about five weeks. Then we went to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. That was for overseas training, they called it. And it was not much different than the basic training, but a little bit harder. And we learned to shoot a rifle and this and that down at Jefferson Barracks. Of course, guns were nothing new to me because I grew up with them. My father used to be a gunsmith and had all kinds of guns. We went, used to go squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, pheasant hunting all around Hoopston. Years ago, you could go and find this stuff, and uh, you know, you'd get extra food that way by eating the rabbits and the pheasants. And we did that for years. So uh, anyway, I went at Jefferson Barracks. We left there in February, I believe, early February, of '43 from St. Louis and jerked their way out across on the train, the troop train, and they ended up in Fort Lawton, Washington. That's right close to Seattle. So I stayed around there a while, and I got uh, a very high fever one day, one Saturday night. I went to bed, and the next morning I woke up with this high fever in the orderly room. People weren't said, you don't need to go to the doctors. You're just trying to goof off. You know, that was everybody's thing was right there, not do what you're told to do or want to do. But that wasn't the way it was me. So I went to the doctors on my own, and they put me in the hospital for 10 days with a very high fever. And back then, I think uh, penicillin was not new. There was some other medicine they give you. And I finally got through there, come back, and on the 18th of March, I loaded, well, Friday night before, on a Thursday night before, I loaded on a troop ship, and we left out of Seattle on the 18th of March, 1943. We headed to, in that passage, all the way to Seward, Alaska, and uh, from there we took a train into Anchorage, Alaska, and from there we stayed about, oh, a week maybe, a little over, and we got on another train and headed south to a uh, port of Whitaker, it was on the Alaska Peninsula coming down, and we boarded a ship there. And it was about 5,000 men on that ship altogether. And were all the men uh, the Air Force, the Army Air Force? No, some of them were different branches, okay. because I, a lot of them I never saw any. But some of them were uh, Army, and they are uh, not Air Force. They were ordnance people on the same one, because I... And uh, that's what I thought I should have been to be able to work on vehicles because they wouldn't let me work on them because I wasn't ordinance. So anyway, we go down the islands and on the way down, we stopped at uh, Kodiak Island just for overnight something. They didn't travel for some reason. And then the next day we take off and go down uh, to Adak Island. There's another. This is a long island chain to go down to the far end of that too. So uh, I offloaded there, and we spent uh, some time there on ADAC. We, they bivouacked us up in the mountain about three miles from the lower base. But I was, uh, the, we had a CO by the name of Taylor, Major Taylor, and he was a wonderful guy. He reminded me a lot of Clark Gable back then. So uh, he took a liking to me, and I would drive the supply truck, go down, get stuff to bring up for you know food and stuff like that because we had all these 240 men there had to eat and sleep somewhere. So uh, we got along good, and then at night I'd go back and drive a 6 by truck and haul bombs from the bomb dump area to the flight line. Now these bombs, they were, I call them, they were, would have been alive, but they didn't have the detonator in the front end of them, and with that, they were no danger of exploding. So I hauled bombs there for quite a while, and then I worked on the docks at night, unloading barges and stuff like that. And every, every night it would be dark and we'd have very little lights. And all, all you could think of about was a Tokyo Rose is going to have a torpedo from one of their two men subs blow up the docks, which never did happen because she was always putting out the propaganda on the radio. And you kept track of what we were doing up in the ocean. So uh, finally I got on another boat and then on down to At Two. While the Battle of At Two was going on, I got down there shortly after it started and set the dock. The, the, the Japanese had an island pretty well built up. You know, they had a dock for unloading stuff. Mm -hmm. So this big ship set up at the dock. And well, by the next morning I was there, I looked overboard and there was a, on the other side, there was a, a, one of our submarines docked tied up beside us. So we did nothing but sleep and, sleep and eat and play cards and while we were sitting there. We couldn't get off the boat. Or ship. I said, you don't want to call them boats, the Navy people, they're all ship. Anyway, 
we, we could hear the guns and the battle going on up there further in the mountains, you know. The, so one day, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, I was called off to board a barge, and the Navy tug pulled three barges about 42 miles southeast of that to the island of Shimia. It's a very small island, only about two miles before, and the, uh, it sits on a northeasterly, I mean northwesterly angle, and uh, very, there was nothing on there. No trees was on the island. The only thing was there was some blue fox. And you never seen a, you've seen red fox, but you've never seen a blue fox. And they were blue. And anyway, we had to move in on the south, um, southeast side of the island. And at the same time, the engineers had built a steel mat runway about oh, a quarter of a mile long. And that's all it was there. No airplanes could land there uh, at that time. So um, I lived on that south side and we were living in tents. We had to move our tents around all the time because they was, the caterpillars and stuff would take sand away to build a runway base. So finally, we, uh, my outfit went back. This was in the summer of 43. And the outfit I first was, went in, they went, most of them went back to the States, exception 50 of us. And this was in late October of 43. And I was one of the 50 who had to stay on the island. And I cried like a mongoose because I never went to any schools. I didn't cost the government anything. And here, you won't let me do the job I want to do, but you're going to keep me here. So in the meantime, I'd been working in supply in various places. Uh, salvage yard, when the airplane crashed, I'd tear up, take the good parts off and be put back in supply so they could be used on other airplanes. They did that for a while, and uh, then the outfit broke up, like I said, and I had to stay. So the maintenance officer had to stay, a lieutenant by the name of Ernest Taylor. He had been a lawyer out of Tennessee, and he was a nice guy, just a southern boy. So uh, after that, uh, I was working in salvage, tearing up the airplane, and I told him, I said, since you're short of mechanics up there, why can't I work on an airplane? I said, I'm, I, I know... Mechanics, you can check my records and I see that I passed uh, automotive real good. So he did. Then I started working on airplanes. My first airplane was a P-40. And it's a fighter plane. We had those on the island. And they were the ones that liked to do China, India, Burma Theater over there. They had lots of P-40s. Anyway, I, that was my first airplane. They had books. All the airplanes had books. We, a, diff a different section of the airplane was covered in a book. If you could read or write and you could understand, you could fix an airplane. There's some technical stuff that some people could never do. Anyway, I started working on the airplanes, and the P-40 had a bad habit of the landing gear getting dirt in the gear mechanism, and they would, uh, wouldn't retract when you come in to land. So they'd make a belly landing, make a good belly landing, and they'd tear up the wing and the propeller and the engine, but the fuselage was still there. So we get uh, from the states. They'd get new wings in a big box. The wings would have the uh, landing gear, the fuel tanks, and everything in there, except in the fuselage. You took this all apart, bolted it on. There was a jillion bolts on both sides of the fuselage. You bolted to this wing. Everything was precision made, and we put a new engine on the fuselage, the mounts, and everything, a new propeller, and it'd be ready to fly again. One day we give, and we didn't own the airplane. This squadron did not own the airplane. It belonged to a fighter squadron. And we give it back to the squadron. And two days later, they, um, they, they don't trust anybody, see. They had to tear it apart, and they ended up messing it up. They uh, got the throttle linkage. You could turn a bell crank on the outside of the firewall one way, and it would make throttle wide open. Or if it was the other way, it would be closed when you thought it was closed. So this one day... One of the pilots cranked up the engine, and he thought it was closed throttle, but it was wide open. The engine started up, and I don't know why it ever did, so any of them, it took a little time to start up. But uh, that thing nosed over and tore up the prop in the engine again right there. They had to take care of that themselves. And another one, about two weeks later, we'd sent back, and uh, it made, they, everything was test hop from our squadron before it go back to their squadron. Airplane was in good condition. It goes back, and about the second time it flew, the pilot was landing, and it was 
uh, down toward our maintenance area, and he was landing on the, from north, northwest to southeast, and he put the brakes on a little bit, and the right brake locked up on it, and it pulled him off the steel mat runway into the sand along the side of the runway. So, I mean, when it started pulling off, well, he put the other brake on you know, to hold it. But anyway, the airplane tipped clear over from the nose and landed upside down. He was going maybe 50 or 60 miles an hour over that time, and it it tilted it clear over on the nose, upside down. And there he is with his shoulder harnesses on. And right behind the pilot, there was a gas tank, a fuel cell, fuel tank, but there's a fuel filter cap right back of his head about uh, less than a foot away. And fuel was running out, this 130-octane fuel, high-octane gasoline, very explosive. And there's a, some engineers were working on the side of the runway filling sandbags with sand. And I saw the airplane do this because, you know, you just nose around when you're working on your own airplane. We was out in the open all the time working on airplane. So I saw it tilt over, and I ran down there, and uh, these engineers had beat me there, and they had these little trench shovels, we call them, filling sandbags, and I was beating on the canopy. The canopy slid back and forth right over the pilot's head. And, boy, I got down there and stopped that because one little spark that could have caught the airplane on fire, and that man would have died right there. So I couldn't get his belt loose without cutting it because the way they were made and designed and hit all his weight on it. So he, he fell out on the ground and didn't hurt him anything because it was right there two foot from the ground. And it was upside down like that because the tail end was holding it off the ground. Anyway, that afternoon, he... He, after he had to go take another flight, they don't let them just stand around and think about what happened. They make them go in an air, another airplane right away, or they lose their nerve to fly. And uh, that afternoon, he came down and uh, told our little major, we had a major that had 32 years in the service, the name of Major Tra uh, Tracy. We called him Dick Tracy when he wasn't around. <laughs> anyway, he knew he was an old 32-year-old military man and knew it all. But anyway, that afternoon, this captain come down. He says, where's that sergeant to save my life? Well, they called me in. He says, I want him to run around with me this afternoon if you don't care. And he had a fifth of whiskey. We didn't get drunk, but we did drink some of it. And anyway, I, I didn't get any recognition for that. It was just in your daily work. You know, that's part of your job. But if I'd have been uh, a boy working in the orderly room or somebody, I'd have got a ribbon for that. But I didn't, I didn't get many ribbons during World War II. So that was just another part of my day's work. They figured it, and it, it happened later on after the war. I was in Duluth, Minnesota, and it, I saved an airplane there, but I didn't get any recognition for it because that was my job. Anyway, after that, we, uh, we moved up to, into a different quarters of Pacific huts along the runway, and the first Sunday, I think it was 44, a B-24 was on takeoff raid to go to Japan, northern Japan. There was 12 of them in the flight. And I don't know, maybe number three or four on takeoff. Uh, he lost control of the airplane. It crashed into two other parked airplanes and a building, a small Quonset hut. It was an evacuation building for guys that was going back to state to spend the night there, maybe, or medical evac. So... They uh, fell on the ground about 150, 200 feet away because it wasn't that high. See, that's why he ran into the airplanes. He was flying along, and we had a crosswind. And the crosswind was from the west, southwest. And uh, these two build buildings up there, when the pilot was uh, controlling the airplane to fight the crosswind, but when he got to the buildings, they broke the crosswind up and created a vacuum. And he pulled over to the left and ran into these parked airplanes. And anyway, when the airplane landed, on it landed on upright, but it had the wheels coming up at that time. So about then, a minute after he landed, a 500-pounder bomb detonated. It dropped out of the bomb bay shackle and detonated. See, when they put the bombs in there and they put the detonator in the end of it, they have a wire that's hooked to the uh, bomb bay rack. So when that bomb leaves, the wire pulls out and the bomb is active. It's alive. From that on, and it only fell a little bit, but it fell right on the nose and blowed up, and it killed everybody on that airplane but the pilot and the tail gunner. And I had the privilege of helping clean up the mess the next morning on a Sunday morning. I'd find men's hands in gloves and feet with shoes in them, 
and it's just really something you don't want to see. I couldn't eat for two days, and the bomb, uh, yeah, bombardier is setting up in the nose section. When this hit, hit, it slid into a, what we call a generator house. It was a place where they had a generator to, for runway lights. And the boy that run that, he was out along the runway about 80 or 90 feet away. And he started, when it happened and he ran into his building, he ran toward the airplane. And about that time, the bomb went off and he got killed from concussion out there. And he wasn't even in the airplane. But that's how close he was. And there was a, the airplane, where it landed, there was a little ridge on the left side of it, about 50 feet away. And it went down into the ordnance people area and they found the pilot and co uh, gunner down in that section. They weren't even on the airplane. They were down in that section when they found them gazed. So the, we lost, uh, that was a, nine men on that airplane lost that morning. So anyway, that was uh, just more work, the type of work I did, and I was on the salvage, uh, rebuilding airplanes. I was on the fire crash crew, because uh, when I first got there, we had a civilian uh, fire chief, but he was on the main side of the island, that was a mile away from us. So any time we had a crash or anything, we'd have a pickup truck and a trailer with just fire extinguishers. And the, the uh, one truck we had was serve water for the bay, for our area, you know, just got water out of the lake. But it had usually 500 gallons of water on it all the time. And we'd have it to fight fires. So I fought many fires as a different airplane crashes. And they, when they crash, they're pretty dangerous stuff still until you get them. Uh, deactivated the batteries out, the guns dis disarmed, and all that stuff. So there's one time uh, in '44, I was working uh, down in the flight line in the, in the hangar. We had a hangar by then, built big, a big wooden hangar that the Corps of Engineers built, I guess. But we was working in there one day, and this B-24 come in, and at the end of the runway, they had some heavy eight by eights, I think, the word, with a couple of little antennas on it for the final approach for these airplanes, because most of the, much of the time in the summer of, up there in the Shimia, the fog was real heavy. I mean, it would stay for days and you wouldn't see the sun. It was just that heavy fog. But he made a pass and then he come back around and did land, but he hooked the right main landing gear on one of these uh, big beams there and knocked it loose. When he landed on the main left main and the nose gear, the right one was collapsed, so that drug the airplane and made a big U-turn. Well, it made a U-turn and was headed toward the opposite way it come in. And when it did, there was a, it ran off the runway, and there was a small ditch where they'd used it, made a, for the sand to build a runway. They made a ditch there and had about two foot of water in it, about six foot wide. And the wingtip hit a dirt bank a little higher above the ditch. At the same time, uh, one of the officers was getting ready to get out of the airplane right back of the pilot. And he was, uh, there's a hatch back there about oh, two foot wide and maybe three foot long. There's a curve to fit the fuselage. So when he was up there to get out, the wingtip hit the dirt bank. The number two engine was still turning. And when it made the sudden stop, he flew into the right uh, number two engine propeller. Well, I'm down there fighting fire, and uh, with the uh, fire chief finally got over there, and all we had was fire extinguishers. but when the airplane crashed, a fuel line came loose and caught fire. Gasoline was running out of the wings right on top of that water, and fire was on the water, and we were sucking water out right under the fire to put the fire out. And the, and the uh, chief got down there, he had... Uh, Five gallon cans, I think they call it, was said it was horse blood, but it was smother the fumes. So if you don't have the fumes, you don't have a fire. You take something away, oxygen or whatever. Anyway, I'm up on top of the wing of that B 24 and it's, everything's all wet. And I slipped off to the back side and uh, landed in the water about two foot deep. And I felt something there, didn't feel normal. They'd been yelling, there's one man missing, see, by then. I knew there was one man missing. So I stepped on his arm or something, so I reached down in the water and started to pull him up. I got under his arm, and he was cut about half in two. And I yelled for the medics to come over there because I wasn't the medic, and they got him out finally. But uh, he was the only one who got killed on the airplane. But that was a crash. But that airplane was not rebuildable. It broke in two and all that stuff of the fire. So 
anyway, in 1940, well, they built a uh, breakwater. The airplane wouldn't have a, a decent dock and uh, cove for uh, ships parking, so they built a big breakwater out there. It's about 40 foot high, and they uh, block and a half, two blocks long, just to keep the water. Because the weather up there was so bad, and the old Bering Sea was so rough. Have any of you ever watched these programs, like the fishing fleet up there now, and uh, how they battle the waves in the Bering Sea? Anyway, there's a big storm come up and tore that breakwater down. That's how bad the waves were. But in the meantime, I was on the, I got a mainland recuperation furlough in November of 1944. A lot of people didn't want to take it because it was afraid it would affect a rotation date. Well, our CO had been a professor over at the University of Illinois, and I talked to him about, would, uh, I said, nobody seems to want to go up there, but I'd like to go. I said, how's this going to affect our rotation date? He said, Sergeant Burge, but, uh, when you leave, we'll give you orders so you'll be covered from the base, but when you get back, the orders are tore up and there's nothing on your record, see? Because you got 30 days vacation every year. And if you didn't take it, you could build up and you got paid, you know, so many, if you, like when I retired, I got paid for a couple months of vacation. I wouldn't know where to take it, but that one time. Anyway, I went up to the mainland and spent a month up there. And then when I came back on a boat, I went on a civilian steamship company, regular, it wasn't the military, but it was hired by the military to transport troops. So I ended up on the AT-2 in a casual company called waiting to get a boat to come back to Shimia. So it's up there in the mountain about three miles from down to the base, but you can see the air base down there. And we had some B-24s, the 404th Bomber Squadron or the Photo Recon Squadron had these B-24s painted black for radar resistance. So they were uh, photo jobs. They run over northern Japan, take photographs all the way down as far as they could go and get back home. So I saw that airplane land, and I asked the first sergeant, I said, can you give me that male boy that drives that Jeep, take me down there so I can get back to Shimia, because I don't want to be up here in the casual company doing nothing. So I went down, talked to the pilot, and he said, sure. So I'm, we get up, and we get in the fog. You could see the island once we got a little airborne, but the fog sets in real quick. So we couldn't see it when we got first got over there. So I, I all I think about is this airplane going to crash like the one it did, did before. I want to bail out. <laughs> so anyway, we got in there and uh, the fog cleared enough and made a perfect landing. Where were the planes going away out of the air? Out of Shimia, they bombed Japan and northern Japan and the Korea Islands. One day we fixed up a B-24 with a larger oil tanks on it and everything, it was a photo recon job, and it flew down and was out 24 hours. Of course, it had Bombay fuel tanks in, didn't have any bombs, taking pictures, and everybody was worried that it was lost, and it really wasn't. It was still airborne in 24 hours, one on that one, without landing. So others went down there. We had one who went down there with the uh, zeros got after it and uh, shot the number three, three engine oil cooler out, but the pilot didn't want to shut that engine off, just have to because if he's got a dead engine, they're all going to really gang up on him. So he let it windmill, the engine, the wind and the other three engines pulling aircraft caused the windmill, the engine would keep turning over, but it wouldn't have any power. So finally, it, since it ran out of oil, it stripped some reduction gears on the prop to the engine and it windmilled all the way back, but the engine wasn't turning then. And it was so bad that the wind, uh, propeller was hitting the cowling on the leading edge, of the, which it should never hit in normal time, but that's how bad. But anyway, the pilot and the co-pilot both got shot pretty bad, and the flight engineer was a tech sergeant. He's a guy that knows more about the airplane than anybody else. He's in charge of the maintenance on it, on the ground and in the air. Anyway, he got down out of his, he did, after they got out of the combat area, he got down and got in the pilot, relieved the pilot, got him out of the seat, and flew that airplane back to the island of Shimia. I forget how many hours that trip was when the, when they got shot up bad, but he landed it too. So enlisted men could fly an airplane. What happened if they didn't make it back? 
Well, I'll tell you, most of the time, I, I would have to set up at nights when a mission was still out and uh, wait. We'd get word. We'd wait and wait 10 o'clock at night, maybe. And we'd get a call in. We wouldn't have any runway lights on until we knew they was about ready to come in. 10 o'clock at night, you get a call. We were out 15 minutes away on the way in. Never hear that airplane again. They ran out of gas, landed in the Bering Sea or the North Pacific, and you never find anything of any of them. Eleven men would be gone to the airplane because the water is so cold, even if they had bailed out or within a raft, most likely they would have died within 30, 40 minutes from the cold weather. The water was so cold up there. And we lost many of them that way, B-24s and some B-25s and about every other airplane. You said some of them ended up in Russia. Yes, now some of them would get shot up and crippled up bad. They had a, a business a deal with Russia that they could fly into Russia and be uh, interned. But Russia would take and keep the airplane. Well, their internment more or less acted like they were prisoners of war from what I could hear back then. They never come back to the island. We were on. They were relieved after the war, but that's how Russia treated our people back in, during the war. We were still their enemy. It's just when, even after the, I stayed, I went back into service after I got out and was in what they call the Cold War, and we had to be on guard against Russia the whole time, and we still should be today. They're a different group. I don't know why. I guess they uh, they hate us because we didn't. Uh, or rigging, maybe make them tear down the wall. I don't know what it was. But anyway, I stayed up there and uh, done all that stuff, met a lot of good people. I met some people. That you, you meet all kinds of people, but some of them are they're a lot of friends, but some are real close friends. I had this uh, one guy I used to work with by the name of Jim Kreider in Knox, Indiana. He was a young, we were all young punks, full of energy and, and didn't know what to do with it all. We had a little hobby shop there. We learned photography. We had a little boxing, but I didn't like boxing because I didn't like get hurt. <laughs> anyway, um, Jim and I had worked on airplanes. So one day there was a Navy airplane come in, a, a C-45. This is a small twin-engine airplane. I have five people on board, but it flew in from AT-2, and it was having engine trouble. So I'm in the hangar working on a big uh, Martin B-26 that had crash-landed or landed a, and and taxi, and he ran off the runway and tore up the wing and the aft section. So I was rebuilding that airplane, and I, they had this maintenance officer, a new guy come out of South, uh, North, he was from North Carolina. His name was Boatwright. But when he first got there, he'd tell us, now, I'm Captain Boatwright, and uh, you're so-and-so, and that's the way we were going to talk to people. Well, us old-timers didn't quite approve of that. So uh, one day, nobody talked to him. One day he asked me, he said, what's the matter with these people? They won't talk to me. I said, well, you want to call him soldier or boy? You said uh, you were Captain Boatwright, and that was your name, and we were Sergeant so-and-so, but you never used those terms to us. And I think, I, you're getting a cold shoulder. But he mellowed out, changed real quick. But anyway, the C-45 landed that one morning, and I'm inside, and of course, you get to hear the noise, and the, the line chief and the number one guy he thought was great was trying to fix this airplane out there. It wouldn't run right. So I kept teasing this captain. I said, hey, if you had a good mechanic out there, they'd been on their way back home to at 2. So about 3.30 in the afternoon, I said, Captain, tell you what, you let me and Jim Kreider and I, we'll come back and fix that airplane after we eat supper. He said, all right, if you think you can do it. So we went back there and this radial engine, the engine, you'd rev it up to about 1,800 RPM and it'd start backfiring. So it wouldn't go any higher. So Jim and I went out there, and I said, Jim, it's got a valve problem somewhere. I said, you start up at the number one cylinder and work your way down. It had little covers on the uh, valve cover on the cylinders, two valves on each cylinder. So I had two little caps, like with four little bolts. You'd take them off, and you check the valve. You'd have to rotate the engine or propeller to make sure it was on top dead cylinder and all that stuff. And I said, I'll start on the bottom and work my way up the other side. They had in the very bottom a little thing called a sump pump. The oil on these was not like in a car. It wasn't in the crankcase. It was in a tank back there. They had a pump to pump the oil in and a pump to pump the oil out, back out. So it never had, it wasn't full of oil. 
So he worked his way down. If we really didn't examine it real close, we'd have saw this one cover right next to his, would be his last one. It was bulging out a little, just kind of cracks, but not enough to leak oil. So we've t adjusted that one valve, put everything back together in about an hour and a half, and running the engine, checked out perfect. So I called up the, uh, this boat right, the big shot. He, he was, turned out to be a nice guy after a while, and told him to get the pilot and the crew down here. That airplane's ready to fly. He couldn't believe it. So he come down there, and I had to show him getting the car. He didn't, he didn't know how to fly. He wasn't, a ma he wasn't a pilot. He was just a maintenance officer. Got him, showed him how. I said, just see both engines running perfect. I said, the airplane's ready to go. So we got a gas truck and gassed it up, and he went and got to hold the Navy crew, and they flew out of there that night to go 42 miles away. But I, the reason I knew what I was talking about, I asked the crew chief, they had a crew chief that flew on that airplane, a flight engineer like I turned out to be later on, and I said, when was the last time you had a 100-hour inspection on this engine, and they may have set the valves? He said, about five or six hours back. Well, anyway, when they set the valves, they didn't tuck up the lock nut on the adjustment screw on the valves, and that had come loose. And that one rocker arm was just a flopping to beat the band, and when it got a certain RPM, it would pop that one valve open just by bouncing this rocker arm. So that was the clue that I knew what I was working on, already looking for the trouble by the, what the crew chief told me. Why, why were people, why were you sent to the Aleutians? Say again? Why was the, what was the main reason for sending you to the Aleutians? Why, what part of the war were you, were you fighting, in essence, up oh, there? Oh, we were in, uh, see, the Japanese had already landed up there in Dutch Harbor or someplace, and I was already on the island of Kiska, and uh, the general up there against the government's borders wanted him, didn't want to, but he built a runway down on the island of Adak, see, and that was where we ended up, first island I landed on. It was a kind of a mountainous island. It was... Uh, had a low area, and they went in there in no time at all. The engineers, they pulled sand from everywhere and pumped water out of ponds and made a runway in a very short time. And uh, that's where the jumping off point, and that's when they started to uh, really fight the war of Kiska and at two. The men were already there. They bombed and bombed and bombed both places before they ever landed any troops there. I had all this bit on the paper that's showing uh, in my stuff I brought today, would show day by day about how things went on in the Aleutian Islands. But Aleutian Islands was a secondary thing, mm -hmm. and uh, we was kept up there to keep them from coming forward and also make them tie up troops so it wouldn't be able to go to the South Pacific. It would be less firepower they had down there if they were being invaded by the North. Did you know a lot about what was happening in the other theaters? Well, we had what they call orientation movies. We'd get about once a month or so, and uh, we'd go to a theater or in the hangar, and they'd show the movie, and we'd get orientation, know what was going on in Germany and the South Pacific somewhat. Yes, we did have that. Yeah, and we eventually they build up. We was living in the tents for a long time and in the Pacific huts, and then eventually moved into a, a they built a mess hall, a big mess hall, and it was designed as an H figure, it, letter H, you know, the center sections where the cook all took place, but the other side was this seating room for everybody. So this little friend of mine from uh, California, Malcolm Ford, his little guy, from Sacramento, California, he worked in supply, and uh, everything had come in, the movies had come in to supply, and we didn't, they were supposed to go to the theater two or three days now, but we sat up all night and watched two or three movies in our, we had a projector, and we sat up all night in, in that part of the mess hall, which wasn't used. We see the movies before they ever got to the base. What kind of movies? All kinds of uh, just westerns and whatever. Yeah, back then. Once in a while, there'd be a little bit on the, about the war elsewhere too. But most of that was come through the government uh, orientation movies. We'd have, we'd have to go see. So that was uh, that was a big part of it too. And uh, I would say out of uh, the group that went back when I would have liked to have gone, they rotated back through the states, and some of them 
the lower rank and air men got assigned to the infantry and they ended up in the South Pacific getting killed. So after I found all that out, I thank the Lord that I stayed right where I was because I wasn't in any real danger. Now, we did have uh, <clears throat> a couple of airplane raids on At-2 while I was there. That was 42 miles away. But we had the fighter planes on our island, and they had mostly uh, some fighter planes over there, but mostly B-25 bombers. But the Japanese come in with a fleet of 12 bombers, and they tell me that the Japanese only had one bombardier and navigator, and everybody else followed suit. See, that's how bad off they were of our personnel. When the first guy had done his work, they had a certain time to drop theirs after. But anyway, when they had the two raids over there, why our base commander wouldn't let the P-38 airplanes that we had, they were a long-range airplane, could really fly, outrun anything that the Japanese had at the time. Uh, but we had the P-40s on, could stay on our island, patrolled, because they figured it, we were going to be the main hitting place. This is just a, 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 a lead on over there to deflect what was going to happen to us because we was where the big bombers flew out of. But the P-38s could have flown over there and shot all those down if they'd have let them go. And that, uh, that didn't happen, though, two different times. We was in our foxhole. I was hoping for it because I'd like to shoot a rifle <laughs> try to hit an airplane, but it never happened. So... That was uh, some things that we had to live with all the time. And then they had no more raids after that. Two times is the only time they come back to try to bomb that too. Mm -hmm. And when they did, they buy, there were ships in the harbor, but they never hit one. They hit the water and never did hit a ship. No damage was done, as far as I can remember. And anyway, after the war, the big war was over there. <coughs> Excuse me, first of May, the end of May. They'd hear a... a message, coded message about three o'clock in the afternoon. And they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So once they decided we're going to keep this, everything down, no communication going anywhere around two to three or four in the afternoon, if possible. So they could still hear the message. So uh, later on, there was a Navy guy that come in on, you know, on a ship, and he wanted to go up see where the battleground was and all this and that. So he's up there trudging around on the tundra and the, on the side of the mountain and fell in a hole. Well, in this hole, there's a Japanese with a shortwave radio, hand crank job. He could sit there and he could look right down on the runway, maybe a mile and a half, a mile down there and see everything going on, and he was sending out reports every day, the activity at the runways. So he, <laughs> he was scared, but he got the Jap, and they got him down, and I saw him. He flew through. They transported him out of there in a day or two, I suppose, after all the interrogation over that, too. But they landed on the island I was on <clears throat> to pick up other troops to go back to the mainland. But that was the only one Japanese left, as I can remember. Everything else, they died during the war because... The, uh, the commanding officer forced them to commit Harry Carey, you know. They tried to kill our people. They even killed their own people in the, their, their dispensaries. So they didn't, that was our way of doing Don't get captured. Those Americans are too rough on you. So I think most of them got, uh, were not captured, just the hamlet. But he would slip down at nights and uh, get steal food from the mess hall, and that's how he lived. And this was about two months later, three months at the most, that uh, he was still there. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I stayed on the island the end of May of 1945 because I was one of the oldest guys on the island because I come over on the barge as the first one to hit the island. And so I was one of the first ones to go out of our squadron. <clears throat> I went to, I was going to join another outfit in Alaska, uh, Anchorage. It was a 39th Air Depot group. They, they did major work on airplanes also. But anyway, I got back up there, and the, maintenance, uh, the CO had been our maintenance officer when I first went down to the island of Shimia. He ran around in a dark uh, sundown, sunglasses on all the time, and we called him uh, the Green Hornet, <laughs> but not in his face. Anyway, he saw me and he said, Sergeant Bird, there's nothing for you to do. You don't need to get a toolbox or nothing. Just stay around till we go back to the States. 
And I said, when that go? Well, it said pretty soon, pretty soon. This was in the first of June by then. So there was four of us in that group, and we were in town one day, didn't have nothing to do. We could do anything we wanted to to stay out of trouble. So we were in town one day, then one afternoon, I can picture it right now, walking along the street, and the second lieutenant was there, and we just walked on by and never saluted him. Just, you know, you had to salute these officers. And he took my name, turned me in. So next day, I got called into the major, or the captain. He hadn't made major yet. And he says, what's going on? And I said, I don't know what you mean. He said, well, you were in town yesterday, and you didn't salute this second lieutenant. Ah, uh, not used to saluting people too much. Captain Swanhart was his name. Anyway, he said, you, got, you know better than that. So we didn't get any punishment for it, which, you know, he just told us, don't be that way again. Give them all the... Did your family know where you were? My family did not know from the time. I left Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, and I went to Seattle and wrote a few letters, but I don't know where I'm going out of Seattle, Washington. From the time we rode on that ship, everything was top secret. You didn't write anybody. You didn't call anybody and tell them anything. One time while I was out in Shimia, <clears throat> the way the island is, and the international date line comes down, and it jogs out to cover all the island chain. At two, and then it goes straight south. I forget where it goes down, maybe close to Midway, the international date line. So I tried it write it in a letter, and I don't know if my folks would have understood it anyway, you know, unless you know geography fairly well. I said, I should, should be into tomorrow, but this, today is a date, and I got censored for that because all of our mail was censored by an officer. And he pulled, called me in, and I had to rewrite the letter, and he warned me not to do anything like that again. That's the closest they ever come to trying to let them know, but they did not know because everybody, everything was an APO number. And out in Seattle, Washington, they had APOs, and maybe some went to the South Pacific, but everything in Alaska and up there was, a, I think ours was 729. And a, people in the post office don't know anything about where it is, really, so they can't tell anybody either. 729 was the APO number, and that would be the island of Shimia, where I was on. The other different ones had different co uh, APO numbers, but nobody knew Anything until I come back from the sta uh, from Alaska, we got on a ship, or we got on a train in Anchorage and come down to Stewart and got on a another train and come clear across Canada on train to uh, Edmonton, Canada. We had a layover there about four hours one afternoon, and I sent a telegram to my mother down in Hoopston, Illinois, and said that I, I'd be home in a few days. That was the first I could say, and that's all I said. Didn't say where I'd been or anything else. Just I'd be home in a few days, and that's. And there was um, I had two other brothers in the service at the same time. One of them was on the both of them were in the navy, and the younger one was on a submarine during the war, and the other was on a destroyer escort in the South Pacific. So uh, that was the first time my mother or anybody knew I was in town. So we come into Camp Grant, stayed a couple of days there and got uh, turned in some stuff and got some different clothes. And then a friend of mine by the name of David Brown from Rossville, he'd went in at the same time I did. There's a whole other group, but he was the only one that went end up where I did. He he come down to the island uh, shortly after I did and stayed a little while and went back to the mainland, but that was the same squadron I joined, the 39th Air Depot, when I come back to the States. So him and I leaked up together, you know, and we come into Camp Grant and we had to get processed and uh, then find, well, we came to Chicago first and then back to Camp Grant and got processed and we were supposed to um, leave uh, Chicago and go to Roswell, New Mexico. This is all just before the war is over. We were supposed to start, a, the whole unit was going to start a new outfit in Roswell, New Mexico. So while I'm home, <coughs> We was, well, we were supposed to report back to Chicago, which we did in 30 days. But in the meantime, the war got over. I was home in Hoopston up here when the first atomic bomb was dropped. I was right here in Hoopston in, the, in August of 45, 1945. Do you remember the reaction? Yeah, I was thrilled to death myself. And then most other people around here were. But, you know, at the time, there's many people still open their mouth and protest that we dropped that bomb. 
And they don't realize if they've never been in war, and most of them have never been in war, sit around blowing their mouth, that how hard it would have been to invade Japan because every man, woman, and child would have some kind of weapon to kill those Americans. So we didn't have to invade Japan. Now, my younger brother on submarine duty, he was in Tokyo Bay two or three different times with subs, taking pictures at night. They, they, they had a... Uh, submarine net, they called it, but somehow they knew how to get when it would be up and when it would be down. When one of their ships would move in or out, they'd move in too. But they'd take pictures at night. They never torpedoed anybody in the bay. That wasn't their job. They, they knew what it would look like over there. And it would just been terrible. If we, you know, we'd been bombing them, bombing them, but they didn't want to surrender. So when Truman gave the order, dropped the big bomb, that was the greatest thing, one of the biggest deals he did. And that didn't cool them off quite enough yet, so he dropped a second one. So that, that took the wind out of their sails. They had to give up. When you look back at that time, what would you, what would you say about your experience? All worthwhile? I, I upsetting? tell you, I'm going to say this, and it's on uh, film right now. I think World War II is the greatest thing that ever happened to our country. We was in a depression. Everybody was on well. I grew up on welfare. I don't care. And just like people today, I, the food man come around and delivered food and stuff. My mother worked at the, what they call it. It's a WPA thing for women. There was a sewing center here in Houston, right up on Market Street upstairs there. The old buildings are tore down now. But women worked up there and made clothes for, for, for the poor people. And uh, she made $48 a month working there 40 hours. Now, that was a big deal, but that was better than doing nothing. But anyway, I had grew up and I jerked sweet corn. Everything was used to be jerked by hand around here. Canning factories run all day long, and I started out about 14 years old, out in the fields at 2.30 in the morning, team my horses. If it was raining, you still was there, jerking those ears of corn off by hand. I did that for a couple of years. It was hard work. The first week or two, your fingers would bleed because the husk was tear your skin off. Anyway, I done that a while. Finally, I got a job inside the plant, you know. And then later on, like I say, I uh, was out of work. I quit the railroad job because it was just too hard to work. And on the railroad one day, well, this was before the war, of course, uh, I was doing a job, and the, the big boss told me what to do. But the straw boss told me I was going to do something else, and I told him I wasn't going to do it. They had these big jacks they jack up the track with, and he was going to tell them. I had to carry these big jacks two at a time. Here, I'm about a 125-pounder, and I let him know I wasn't going to carry those jacks. And I walked back through the work gang, and the big boss was sitting on a rail back there. And he, I got past him about 10 feet. He says, where are you going? I said, I'm quitting. And what happened? And I told him. He said, you go back up there and do what I told you, because I'm the boss. Don't you pay any attention to the other guy. The other guy, his name was White Neck. The other one, the main boss was from over here in Ambie. I can't call his name right now, but he passed away several years ago. Real nice guy. Anyway, I, I gave up the railroad and went to Cincinnati, Ohio. worked with the U.S. Printing Company a while. That's when I got the draft notice over there. Okay. Then afterwards, I got out of the service and, uh, well, there was many different times as uh, airplanes crashed up there that I Rebuilt a Martin B-26 at Christ, P-38s. One of them, the two were flying one day, and the second man was so close, he flew up, and the P-38 had a double boom on the, t the tail section. And the one on the right engine flew up the left boom of the other and then chewed it off and almost all of his elevator controls. And the one that and lost his propeller, the one that hit the first airplane, and he flew back to AT-2 on one engine, but he had good control. And since our island was pretty well flat, the one that got the main damage, he landed on our island, and I had the privilege of, with four other boys, you know, I was in charge of rebuilding that airplane, take uh, off of another airplane that made a pretty good crash landing. We took off the parts off of one and put them on the other one, and had to re-rig it and everything for and in about a month and a half, and it was ready to fly again. But the P-40s was the same way. They barely landed. We, like I say, we got the big wing in the box and put them back together in about 10 days. And they were flying. But later on, the war was winding down. They knew it. They was going to send these P-40s back to the mainland. 
But on the way back to Adak or somewhere, they lost two out of the four. So they decided when one of them crashed or belly landed again, that we wouldn't fix it. So on one end of the island, there was a high bluff to the water, and I was in charge of the crash crew also. So I had made a, a cable section so I could pick up this one P-40 with a wrecker, a nice big wrecker we had with a boom on it. So I just pick, I made these cables well balanced. So when it crashed, we'd pick it up, take it just right on the back of this big truck, carry it over to the bluff and they, about a half a mile away, and unhook my cables and everything. We set it in such a fashion, all we had to do was lift up the one wing and tip it over into the Pacific or Bering Sea. That's where it would be. We did several that way. Have you ever gone back? No, I've never gone back. I would like to, but I've never caught the occasion when some group would be going. Now, the island itself is closed down to, well, they named it after the war later on, the Ericsson Air Station or something like that. And there's, very, there's a few people out there yet, I guess, making the, maintaining some of the buildings and all. But to, and it's an emergency landing for commercial airlines. It flights that fly, say, from here to Chicago to Tokyo. There's a route they fly with uh, not too far from Shimia. But uh, they made it a law now since they got so many big twin-engine airplanes that can fly all the way nonstop. In case they have an engine trouble, they'd have a place to land. I read the story one time. It had to have, I think, 1,500 miles of landing base, and this would be the only place they could. But if they made a crash landing on the island, they really don't have too much for the medical attention there from what I read also. Do you know what else is there? Is there anything else on the island? Well, there's a few civilian things going on all the time there, but I don't know what all they are. Uh, weather people and this and that keep track of things. But as far as the Air Force, the uh, air base, it's, it's closed down the, for air base people. But uh, I watched it grow from, like I say, about a fourth of a mile or a runway to in blacktop. And during the war there, they had a company out of... Uh, Wyoming or somewhere, Knudsen Construction Company, I think the name was. They come in there and set up a uh, asphalt plant, and they eventually blacktopped the runway. And while they were doing it, Tokyo Rose people knew about it because submarines out there were taking pictures that the, all this smoke going on. The blacktop machine made a lot of white smoke, see. So we had to hear that all the time. We had a radio. We couldn't get to States, but we would get Tokyo Rose quite often on the radio. So uh, that period of time, we, w we weren't really worried too much about getting bombed by them on the, by then because uh, the war was over with that too, but, and they were concentrating more on the south. You know, they had lost the uh, Midway Island down there and they come up to attack us, but didn't do any good. So, and uh, of course, that was all wartime. And I, uh, I enjoyed being there. I, you get lonesome, you know. When, like when there, everybody but 50 of us stayed, I was kind of upset. Uh, I'd like to have gone home like everybody else would. You don't want to be out to the two or four mile island. It is a small island. The wind blew. Any time you was on the beach, the wind was blowing in your face. We all had a little tan because of the wind and the sand. There wasn't that much sun. And it was not extremely cold in the winter. I mean, it was about 15 above. It was about as bad as I think it was. And oh, well, I'll tell you another thing. When I went back to the mainland, uh, before I left, all these guys, oh, bring us some fresh milk. Bring us some fresh milk. Oh, boy, how am I going to do this? So I get up there, and I'm getting ready to come back. They, there was no fresh milk up there. It was all recombined or frozen milk, see. So I said, well... The Red Cross would give us a little ditty bag, you know, with stuff in it. So I had this little bag, and I went to the uh, commissary and the day, uh, day before I left. And I got six quarts of frozen milk. Carnation was the label. It's this fitness little bag. I lugged that around, got on a ship, I rode the tra train down and, uh, to Whittier, and it was cold, so it didn't worry about spoiling. So I got on the ship. And I looked all around, where am I going to put this milk? So I put it in a lifeboat. It was real cold. 
put it in the lifeboat, and every day I'd check that lifeboat. <laughs> it had a cover on it, see, make sure that milk was there. So I got down there and got off the boat. I tucked the milk, went up in the uh, transit area where I had to stay a few days before I caught that ride of the B-24, and I put it in the snowbank up there. And when I come back to Shimia, I had it, and when I got to the barracks, our, our barracks were Pacific huts, and they were put in the ground about four foot deep, and there was snow all around. So when I first get to the barracks, I stick it out in the snowbank, and about that night, I'd... one minute? Anyway, that night, uh, they asked me, did you bring that milk back? Oh, I said, I thought you'd never ask, and they were really delighted when I went out and got that. So that was my career up in the Aleutian Islands. And like I say, I think it's the best thing ever happened to America, World War II. Really do. Is that enough? Thank you. <laughs>